Um, so this is really, really informal. Uh -huh. uh, is the way I want it to be conducted. Um, and the I'm gonna use this. Oh no. Good hands. Teacher's hands. That's right. I'm gonna be on because I ran out of juice on my phone. Oh, okay. So I'm struggling over here with this. Oh. So um, as it said on the very late agenda that just go around and tell what uh, is happening on our boards and commissions. And the reason that I think that's important is that, um, you know, when we come to the CIP uh, budget, you know, trying to, we don't know sometimes what each uh, board or, for example, the, the library or the, the, new, the senior center has been asking for, uh, you know, to be ex expanded for a while. I have no idea. Um, and those things I think we should know about, and uh, I know that we can read the minutes of all of these, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> there are too many of them. So it would actually just be like the highlights of what's going on that you can bring back. So I'm going to start off um, and tell you what's happening. I can tell you a lot about the Front Range Passenger Rail and our Northwest Corridor, but I think Colorado Rail has done a great job of explaining it. and. Um, for me, this is the most one of the most important things that our uh, area, the Front Range, is going to be see happen. And I think everybody on council should be up to date you know, on what's happening with that. Um, and the other thing is that that I wanted. Not, I didn't read all of it mainly because I went to the twelve and eighties and stuff. Yeah. Like that. I don't want to read it. Yeah. So the thing about the Front Range Passenger Rail is that we need to get some of those dollars out of the infrastructure dollars. And uh, there is a application form for a grant called the um, CDIP, the, uh, shoot, just went out of my head. It, it is the plan for the district, actually. We have to have that plan, we submit it to get, there's $500,000 that we can get to actually plan our service delivery plan, which would be everything, operations, number of trains, hours, um, easements, uh, everything that we need to actually plan a rail district. So that is due, uh, if I remember correctly, March 24th. When we met with uh, both the MRA, the, we met twice actually with the Amtrak, who was very, very excited about this rail district. And they um, are really excited about bringing the Northwest Corridor into the rail district, which is the main reason I am on that board. Um, so we're working really hard, and I think that our uh, general manager, Andy Cartian, who is incredible, um, He's almost got that written that that to apply for the five hundred dollars. It's the corridor development plan. That's what it's called, the development corridor. So it's almost ready to go. Um, FRA. I never know if they're just paying lip service or if they really mean that what they what they're really excited about this district. But so far they are. Um, we need. Um, Anyway, I just wanted to get you, give you an overview of that and this article by Colorado Rail sums it up perfectly. The other thing that I wanted to report on was PRPA. The cost of, the cost of what they want to do to bring us into 100% renewable by 2040, like everything else, has tripled. So uh, one of their big costs and it's only because of we are using that on the market is the cost of turbines for wind power. Um, it seems like the competition in the United States to get going on 100% renewable is pretty fierce. And the only place right now that they, that they can get those turbines from are in China, is China. So uh, there's a lot of competition there to, to get those, to get them made, to get them in on time, etc. Um, we do buy that wind power from other states or from other utility companies <coughs> and uh, market it and it goes through our wires for, um, so this is just a real basic overview. Um, the other thing is that it is the batteries. 
So the batteries now that are out there are not capable of giving ERPA or really any utility company the power that they need to store, to run 100% renewable utility. What um, Jason Frisbee and Raj, I don't remember what that's like. Signal setting. Um, went, thank you, they toured the United States looking for more batteries. And the, there is a company that they're pretty excited about, California, that has battery storage up to 100 hours rather than the 25 uh, that they have. And it would take a, a, a line of batteries so that we have enough storage to fill the gaps. Um, the company that they were interested in has chosen ERPA to do a test or a pilot program to test these batteries. Um, it should happen sometime late spring or early summer. So I think that's really uh, exciting because we need to know they're going to work before before we invest in anything. Um, let's see what else we say. Tell you about this. How much are the batteries? Do you know? Uh, no, no, not yet. Um, the other thing is that Eddie, who is the marketing uh, person for PRPA, we've talked and I told him we need, in my opinion, we need a huge community outreach as to what is happening with uh, just placards basically step by step by step. What does this mean going from gas and oil? What is the conversion? What is it, why is it costing so much? And uh, when can we get there? Followed up by a tour of the um, plant so that we can go out and see all of the solar panels that are out there that PRPA has already put in. <coughs> and I think that visual, he, he said that would absolutely work and so did Jason Frisbee and it would be kind of like a traveling show where they would go from the four communities because we need to start doing outreach to explain this, to explain where we're going. So um, that is it. The other thing is that um, Dr. Cog, we're discussing how our Cog, they were including housing funding with our transit funding. They're starting to combine it and seeing that one, especially if we're going to urbanization, we have to be able to address both of them at the same time. So that's what we're discussing now with federal funding, grants, uh, et cetera. Um, and then I'm continuing to work on homelessness, uh, constantly conversing with staff um, because we need for our residents to show that we are having forward movement on this. Can't just keep talking about it and listening to the complaints and asking what are we doing. So I have been working on it for the past year and uh, hopefully we will be able to bring something to the council soon. So that's it for me. Um, we're not questioning, we're just gonna go around and no go questions. No, let's get through everybody's updates <coughs> and then so we can see it. Otherwise the, the, the questions will take eat up our time. So let's just go. Who wants to go next? Oh, okay. I'm going to be short. Okay. I can just stay inside. Five minutes. Um, um, I have uh, three boards that are very active and have asked how they can make more of a difference in terms of city policy. And I have advised all three of them that they should bring more resolutions to council because otherwise we don't know about all the good work that they are doing. Exactly. And so um, there was a miscommunication of some sort between the board members, um, but the airport advisory board has a sustainability resolution um, and then they, for some reason, somebody thought it wasn't ready and they canceled the last board meeting, so it's going to come in March. Um, but uh, uh, I at the request of the guy who did most of the editing, I reviewed it and I thought it was better than the draft that started out that was um, drafted. Uh, but uh, I thought it was very good and clean and not prescriptive. It doesn't make the city do stuff, it just gives the city a good excuse. So I'm very happy about that. There is a new chair of the senior advisory board and 
uh, they, uh, he asked, they always asked the same question, how do you get more in front of the council? And the first thing that they're doing, and I'm working with them on this, is to figure out how to get more um, diversity on the board because the um, populations that we need to serve the most as this as the senior center are not well represented on the board. Um, so I have an appointment with Dawn. Um, uh, we, Art McDonough and I already met with Carmen and we came up with a bunch of action items and I'm taking to Dawn, been to Dawn the end of the week. And uh, meanwhile, Art is out recruiting people. But he's recruiting people who are already leaders in the community. I would like, uh, the, and they may not have time, I would like to do outreach to people who are not leaders in the community. Um, so we're, we're, we're gonna try to figure it out. Um, one way is to, is to make the proceedings um, more accessible. And uh, the Sustainability Advisory Board is, you know, is, is uh, really they are in the same position. Um, they are, they're, they're, they're struggling with some people who are um, wanting to advise counter to the majority in the board um, right now, but uh, so sometimes it's hard for them to get a majority, uh, but they're, uh, they haven't done any, anything you know, earth shattering yet, but, but they're very strong, so I'm happy to see that. It's all that. I can go next because okay. I didn't do my homework, so. <laughs> but um, I can say that we, uh, um, the Human Housing um, Advisory Board, they have um, a new chair as well. Um, and the last meeting, which was virtual, that's the only one I, could have, I attended, um, Molly was doing her presentation. Um, so, and then transportation canceled this month. And then last month, it, it wasn't virtual because I was out of the country, so I didn't attend that for transportation. Um, last month, uh, Sister Cities was canceled, but it was, I didn't get to go this month because it's the same time as Human and Housing Services. Usually, I'm, if I'm here, I go from here and then run over there. So, I'm usually, you know, that's me. Um, what out of what out of board am I on? Um, I'm sorry, I apologize. I would have had a summary of everything that was going on, but um, I know I'm on other stuff. Art and public places is um, uh, Sean's now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. So for the museum and library boards, um, both of them have, you know, a large part of our discussion is around the, um, the L, no, recreation, oh, library, recreation and culture, so the um, You know, just, so the museum seems, the board seems that they're in support, in support. You know, they know that there's a funding, um, they know that they could about uh, you know, this is something they could stand behind. The library is a little more um, vocal on, you know, well, just more, there's a lot more questions. And they, you know, they, I guess their priority is really how are we going to attain that preferred level of service? And so, so they're wanting, before they get behind it, they, they want to, you know, see answers, they want to, um, you know, just, I guess, promises um, as to, um, how much the library, they, you know, the city can commit to adequate design the library. Um, they did get a new sorter, so it was pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> I got to see it, got to see it um, out there at the library. So that was a pretty big, you know, it just helps get people out from behind. You know, just a better use of um, people's time. And, you know, uh, so they're out there with the community, or with their, their um, the patrons, rather than sitting behind and sorting books. So 
we got a chance to speak at that. There was discussion around, you know, again, the meth testing. Um, you know, I think that they did do, and correct me if I'm wrong, staff, um, they did do um, just like a brief test of what they do with the LA bales um, to see, but everything came up fine. So there, there's not an issue, but they did it more out of, you know, if they hear some, you know, somebody say something, they'll, um, they'll respond. So it seems like they've been pretty proactive in that regard. Um, yeah, so then the RCAP, so Sean is taking over, but when we made the transition, it was the day before the meeting. So I just went ahead and went to the, attended the meeting. And one of the things they were talking about, and I can't remember, I meant that to email Charlie, but I forgot, uh, the name of the process composting facility. A1. A1, I think it's, is there another one? Okay. So I know that there's one of the processing facilities, and I believe it's the one we use, or um, that um, will no longer be taking, um, they're only gonna take organics because they have people who are putting in the compost, non-compostable paper plates and other things, so it, it contaminates. So they're, you know, as a board, you know, we're trying to go look up for solutions. I think really, the, you know, just the driving, it, this kind of drives the point home that we need our own regional composting facility. So, um, you know, the other one is just too big for them to navigate, and then so now they're having to throw, and then paper bags too, that was the other thing, is that they won't accept or they'll discard the composting that if it has paper bags because you cannot see what's inside of it. Mm -hmm. So they'll take the compostable bags that are the clear, you know, you can kind of, um, those green they can ones. see through. Yeah, the green ones that you can kind of see through. They'll accept those, but I believe in starting in like end of April, beginning of May, they're, um, they're just going to toss those um, even compostable items. So we're trying to work and figure out ways that we can um, assist and ensure that we can get a more robust um, composting process. And um, the other one, the NGLA, same thing as that um, Marsha, Council Member uh, Martin was saying around, the group wants to be more proactive in the decision-making process. So I think I've heard from a few members, or even when I do my, um, you know, my updates, is that they really want to be able to, I don't know, play, play more of an active role in providing feedback to us of what we can um, bring back to council and and us asking so rather than it, it being just a sit and get that they want to be more proactive in the process so that was one of the reasons why i asked if the survey goes out how can we involve ngla so any opportunities that we can you know and again i encourage them to come forward and public invited to be heard um but but yeah we can really tap into them as a resource because they're going back to their neighborhoods and um, disseminating the information uh, i'm also part of the youth council um, they're doing, you know, they have their focus groups. They have their, their focus for the year. They're revolving around, uh, their focus is around um, recycling, um, earth environment stewardship, um, and mental health. So that was very exciting to see. Okay. And engaged in that process. So, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, I can be quick about it. Um, the golf committee doesn't, they meet like every other month. So, we need, we need the last month. Uh, but the golf committee is really interested in golf and, <laughs> and, and you know, the conditions of golf courses and the dynamic plays in the and they are keenly you know, tuned into what's coming with the update of the sprinkler systems um, that were part of the funding by the bond uh, 2019 bond. Um, <clears throat> Prab is, and I missed the last Prab meeting, had a medical procedure and uh, couldn't show up. So. Um, but I will say they are keenly, they're very enthusiastic about the potential of a bond question. Uh, they were, they, they received a copy of the um, solicitation, the RFP, that has gone out uh, for a feasibility study, specifically in the recreation center. Uh, so they're <clears throat> looking forward to contributing to the, the, to the data gathering process. Um, uh, I will say there's, I think there, I don't think it's just me, I think they're still interested, Harold, in knowing by the end of the year, you know, 
what are the milestones, right? Mm -hmm. not, not trying to, not a gotcha, just have some idea of what kind of, how we mark progress on the eight projects, the, the prior, prior, the big eight projects, and then the projects behind them, so. Um, so, that, you know, that's kind of where they are. Yeah. So, uh, two of my boards are, are the, their commissions, and so they have a very specific function, that being planning and zoning and historic preservation. Uh, planning and zoning, extremely thorough. Uh, and those meetings commonly go four hours, uh, just a couple items. So, uh, it's, it's a long process, and they do a very good job at what, they, what they're tasked with. Uh, they don't do any retreats or, or really come up with any sort of extra kind of projects. So uh, I suppose the Historic Preservation Commission kind of has a similar function in the sense that they're you know, approving statutory items. Uh, they're very picky. Uh, they're very specific. They don't let a lot of leeway go as far as historic homes are concerned. Uh, an example being a uh, homeowner recently came for a certificate of appropriateness to replace the windows of the home and they brought a representative of, from renewal by Anderson with them which as one might imagine are not historically accurate windows uh, so that you know that's the kind of things that they're, they're dealing with they do have a retreat they did a retreat last year and retreat coming up in the next couple of months um, and then one item that continually is on their agenda that affects us uh, as we've previously met with them on the Historic Overlay District, they're continuing to talk about that and are eventually seeking to have another joint meeting to continue to discuss this Historic Overlay District idea. Um, uh, while I'm not public, public media, I think we've all got the email that Sergio has stepped down and is still acting uh, as executive director until they find somebody new. Um, they're really doing it. I think Ryan Forbes is mostly to credit for a lot of the new programming they're doing specifically on Thursday nights. There's other things, and I think that probably is helping with um, subscriptions, which is part of the sustainability that they need for their economic model, uh, as well as the fact that they, they've added a lot of, for those who aren't familiar, um, a lot of other services that they weren't previously offering, you know, uh, such as they have kind of a sound recording studio. It's small scale, so you wouldn't see like a rock band recording there anymore. Uh, they also have, in the last few months or a number of months, uh, started their own online radio uh, station. They want to take it terrestrial as well, uh, and I know that they keep having conversations with the owner of Kegu, I believe, is George. Yeah, George. Um, so that's still there. Uh, commuting Solutions is pretty much continually focused on bus rapid transit. Um, they don't really they'll give a brief nod every now and again to our efforts towards front range passenger rail, but primarily their main focus is um, bus rapid transit, <coughs> baseline, obviously the diagonal, the 287 we'll talk about a lot. Um, I somehow my email address got dropped off the list for the Colorado Municipal League Policy Committee, mm -hmm. uh, but that's since been rectified. And as you can imagine, when, when uh, the legislature's not in session, they don't really do much. But now the legislature's in session, it's ramped back up. And well, I can characterize it that, you know, as you can imagine, there's a lot of different opinions on any given piece of legislation based on whether they're rural communities, the size of communities, and those kinds of things. But I will say, by and large, um, local authority is the theme of the day when it comes to uh, state legislation and trying to hold as much authority at the municipal, municipal level as possible. Um, I think that's all of mine. Can I just add just, just one bit of information? Sure. You know, uh -huh. I know they just they recently hosted a field trip. I think a third graders at LP. It occurred to me that to have achieved the status where it's worthy of teachers taking kids out of school to go there because there's something to learn is a is a significant milestone. And a big change. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing I, I forgot to mention is that next week, the 28th, I am going with uh, Garin Castriana, who is the mayor of the 
Broomfield and hopefully Ashley Silsman to RTD to uh, talk during their PIPDH se session, session of the board meeting about restoring our LX1, talking to them about a different uh, finance model that I talked to Deborah and our two directors about in DC, uh, which they felt was worth bringing up, and um, the partnerships that Deborah Johnson talked to me about helping us with intra-city transit. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna go talk to the board about that. So I might be a little late coming back because it's at five o'clock, unless I do Zoom, but I don't know, in person or it's better. Anybody that wants to go, anybody that wants to help us out and talk to RTD, <laughs> let me know. So, so uh, now we're going to go to the second half, which we're discussing the uh, stadium uh, dollars. And I asked uh, Aaron, the mayor of Brooklyn, if he would read that out. And I put a couple of questions mm -hmm. uh, for just my guess thinking. Sure. And, you know, as we have about a half hour left until. Uh, the LHA board meeting starts, and we're going to be limited on time again. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I do think that the, the questions are a good framework to at least start with. Uh, those questions being, if we don't uh, have gotten in front of us, is what are we trying to solve or address with the dollars, as well as what is the greatest need that the $980,481.19 should address? Um, I don't know if any, anybody would like to start. So I can start, and you know what, because I, it's fresh off the library board meeting when they were asking, because the other thing too is, well, how come you didn't recommend the library <laughs> funding? And yeah, so it was, you know, I had to explain. I mean, for me, it's looking, and this is where um, Councilman Riero and I came to this consensus, this is where we shared the idea, is um, we have a group of, kids in our population who are disengaged with schooling, they're not into sports, they're not, they are kind of falling, we're, we're losing them. We're losing them to gangs, we're losing them to, to crime, we're losing them to easy money through criminal activity and how we can find a way to, to get them on track. And so for me, and this is, you know, in my connections with the, um, the youth council, was I wanted, initially what I was thinking before I, um, gosh, Pete and I sat down, was um, for the money to go to, to towards youth health, or to go to the youth, the children's youth and families. Um, when I spoke with several staff at, um, who are engaged in that, um, in that department, they had programming, they had people to do a program, they don't have a place. To, to support that. So they're often dependent on um, less than ideal um, venues or um, buildings. So, you know, so it's kind of looking at a way to, you know, we thought with one time dollar, if, you know, if, if we go towards program, once the money's gone, the program's gone. So, okay, what's something that could be one time spending, but still enhance an existing program? So that was that was the rationale behind that. But really, for me, it's getting to the kids who we are losing to, to help them get on a positive track, to having positive adult figures in their in their lives. That's that's what I'm saying. And since we were on it together, I could just piggyback off on um, piggyback off of her and just mention that we did meet with you. Um, mm -hmm. services and, and ask them what mm -hmm. are the possibilities what do they want to see mm -hmm. um, how do they what do they want to see the programs how do they want to see it enhanced and, mm -hmm. and as um, Councilwoman Hidalgo Perrin mentioned that you know to extend the programs and to expand the programs is what's needed and so have options for those kids who not only may not play sports, but have other options. Um, so that's when we came up with, you know, a facility that can offer all of those different options for them, whether it was um, gaming or whether it was when we host the, uh, our sister cities from, um, you know, 
from there and they have some place of camp or other opportunities for them are inside of the area and it doesn't have to be a dome but whatever it is we just wanted it to go to youth and family services mm -hmm. so that they can expand and extend their programming um, and just have the opportunity to um, realize their vision for the kids. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, um, I basically agree with that in, in terms of the urgency that Shakita, uh, uh, Council, can you hear all this thing? Can use first name? First name, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. very important. Okay. Oh, good. So, <laughs> so Shakita and Susie have absolutely identified the most urgent need, that that, that is the group, um, how to serve that as a best use of one-time money, I think needs to be discussed more, but that's absolutely the right group. Yeah, I mean, you know, here's what I would add. First of all, I, I, would, I, would, I would agree that there's not a thing that Jesus said I would disagree with in terms of need in a, in a priority population. Um, just the two things kind of resonate in my head with, with this money. One, and this is going to be a bit of a stretch of a metaphor, but we've all heard it about teaching someone to, or get, giving someone a fish, they fish for a day, teaching someone to fish, they fish for a lifetime. And the idea of, of using money that gets spent as a program and then it's gone, like giving fish as opposed to investing in something that serves kids for a long time. For me, the idea of investing in something in a capital expenditure makes sense from my perspective for that reason, whatever it is, whether it's the museum or something else. Um, the other is, <clears throat> I just, there's one way to think about this and that's solving problems. There's another way to think about it, and that is pursuing or realizing opportunities. And I do think it takes you in different directions. Um, and, uh, and I don't, I think we've got serious issues we need to address as a community. I, 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 am, I am right there. Um, but I also think there are times we, we're not solving problems, but we're creating new, we are pursuing possibilities and creating new opportunities for folks. Uh, and I do think that's, that's what, you know, the, the idea that, that I advanced with the museum. Um, uh, part of the, the bigger, mo the, the motivation for timing for me on that was more the, the, the donation from the, the uh, Stewart Family Foundation in terms of a catalyst to, to uh, propose something. Um, so, you know, when I, I'll think about with, the, with others here about problems to solve. I'd also like us to think about possibilities to pursue. And um, if you've only got so much money to spend one time, how do you spend it in ways that serve kids over a long period of time? And not as good as the money would be spent, or as well spent as it would be, in terms of problem solving right now, with, uh, around some urgent needs, um, you know, what might endure over a long period. Uh, sure. So, I, after the Kensington Park shooting, um, Vic Bell called, Vic Bell and I talked a lot actually, but um, he called and was very, very, his community, the Latinx community is very, very concerned and afraid about where their kids are going. And with the information that we got from our um, safety, public safety chief, um, in what they're experiencing, I think that, I'm not sure anybody has a solution that would be long lasting or every community faces this and it seems to raise its ugly head, but what I looked at was what do we have on the other side of town for the kids? We have this, this one, which is a, it's death throws. Um, basically, that's it. We have the youth center um, that offers some things to kids, but it doesn't offer a, it doesn't offer the ability to expand what they're doing. And, and this makes me very nervous, especially since um, we got the input from our staff on what, what is going, what's happening there now with what the kids are doing. 
also from the school district as to the amount of children as young as 10 that are talking about suicide. And uh, I don't know, and I don't know that anybody knows, or we will know for years, if the pandemic has isolated our children so much that they, they haven't socialized enough, they haven't gotten out to society. And the reason I uh, mention this, that part of it is because when we were at the NLC City Summit, that was a huge conversation around the country. Um, and uh, we see it in our city. So as far as the museum goes, I think what you're proposing is good except for the, uh, the combining of the dollars. I would rather see, to be honest, in the 2024, 2023 budget for the 2024 year, to bring it up as a capital improvement project and work it into the budget process. It isn't that I don't want them to have money, I wish we'd done that for the library. Mm -hmm. Say, um, we know that we need to invest more in this museum, we know we need to go, let's look at the budget and see how we can do it. And um, that is going to be a long-term project. It's, it's not going to address something that we might need to do fast. So, you know, Vic's conversation and his um, nonprofit, I, I, by the way, after he came to me, then we found out about the stadium dollars went in August. September, um, September yeah. So I called him and I said, hey, this is out there and it falls right into what the parameters might be for this. So um, I think there's a way we can address all of it, but I, I would like to see something in place this summer because that's when kids are out, they don't have any place to go. And I have to be honest, the kids that are into some of the the drugs and uh, uh, the guns, etc. They're older, and they're not going to go to the museum, and they don't go to the museum, and that that is a problem. Um, so, looking at our city holistically, we need to make sure that every child has something that they will offer them in their off times to enhance their their lives to get them out of themselves. And that, that is my opinion. Is that all right? So, uh, you know, I'm obviously no expert in what kids want to do these days. Um, I don't have any kids, and my nieces and nephews are all over 20, 20 years old now, so. Uh, so I don't, you know, I've heard anecdotally there's just not enough for kids to do. Um, I think everyone's heard that over and over again. Um, and so I think programming is, is a good thing, uh, and expanding that programming to include stuff that, like e-gaming and, and whatnot, would probably be helpful if, if there's the kind of, you know, avenue to do that as far as a space to do it and the money, because obviously those kinds of gaming systems are not cheap usually. Um, but I think one thing that we, we don't think about sometimes is is the social thing. Because kids that don't want to play sports, you don't want to swim or whatever, or, you know, but there's no social outlet. I know when I grew up here, you know, the indoor mall was a place kids would go. And they could hang out. There was there was a roller rink at that time. I worked at that roller rink. And there was lots of, many, most, most of the time with his, with his youth, there was, you know, um, and we just don't have the, Generally, we don't have those kinds of facilities anymore. Um, and even though they were private facilities, uh, I think I do remember going to something like a dance or something like at the youth center when I was young. I don't know if the youth center does any of that kind of programming anymore. It's more just social, not activity based. Uh, it, it, was, it was tight then, too. Uh, so uh, I think that's why you know I, I've suggested, from my opinion, sticking that money in children youth and families because generally they know a lot more they're much more the, the subject expert than i am as far as um, where they're lacking uh, whether it's programming whether it's space whatever that happens to be and that's why i suggest that just because i don't feel necessarily qualified to 
make very prescriptive allocations of money, balance of pennies, etc. Marsha? Um, yeah, uh, Harold and I were trying as usual to drift four hours worth of conversation into 90 minutes. And uh, I know <laughs> the way it all we goes past. We didn't get to the things I really wanted to talk about. But, uh, but Harold, you showed me uh, a survey, and we went through it so fast that I didn't really even get the provenance of it. But it was a survey of young people of the age that were worried about um, asking them what they would like to do. And the main thing I remember is that by far, a place to hang out with my friends was number one. And then a bunch of other things that were more like programming followed that. Um, and sports was, you know, kind of down there, and, and and actually music was kind of down there or around there. But can we yeah, that, see that? We're going to bring it to you when it's when it's ready. So okay, um, I'm having to prep the data, but that was the survey when we had the neighborhood meeting mm -hmm. after the shooting that occurred at the youth center, and everybody kind of talked about what's going on, what do we want to see. And so they surveyed kids in the rewind program. Uh, the uh, youth advisory board was involved in the survey. Um, there were some different groups that they targeted, ages I think fifth grade to eighteen. And so once they get that pulled together, then we will. Because I was seeing it on an aggregate basis, and I want to get more specific to see what are we seeing by age groups. Because the reason they did that was really kind of to inform the youth staff and the city staff in terms of based on in light of what we're seeing, where do we may need, where do we potentially need to pivot in terms of the services that we're providing? One of the things that was interesting is um, youth counseling was something that was at the top of the list, and these were kids that self-identified. And so, but again, it's, I have to do a little more data work on it because it doesn't tell me as much as I think as it could. So the reason I ask for that is one, it seems like it's information that we need. Um, and the other thing, my concern with this, uh, because I've heard over and over again, we're losing a segment of kids. And I would say the older ones are the most at risk because when they graduate from high school, they're they're lost, they're lost. You know, we, we sort of don't have nearly as much input as we did before on it. So um, I'm just really interested in what can we do that, that is really agile. And um, while I kind of am gravitating toward Aaron's camp of let youth and, and families decide, um, We're a government bureaucracy, not known for agility. So is there anything that we can do to light a fire to make sure that something does happen this summer? And um, so, you know, that's where I am. I, and it doesn't have to happen tonight, but I think, I think that it needs to happen in time that if, if, if we're gonna put a boost behind a couple of programs, that we should do it. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what I have to say. I mean, I think, I think Harold pointed out that, um, you know, we do have un, unused, or unutilized, or underutilized space, especially in the summertime. Um, well, we'll call it all right. <laughs> But, but uh, we, we, we do have that, and, um, and although we are limited in, ter in terms of the kind of transportation we can provide, I don't think we're limited this way. I think we can send, we can send kids from the youth center on the east side to Isaac Walton in, in our bus, and we're not violating our covenant with RTD. And so that's one of the things that we could do is let's, I, I think we could survey um, those places and say, oh, we're gonna, 
we're going to hold a dance here, we're going to hold, you know, interesting things. I mean, I, I have a group, I don't even, I haven't watched them lately, um, uh, but there's a, there is a local nonprofit private group, Grey Haven's Philosophy, that is just masterful about their youth programming. Maybe we could get, uh, you know, get them involved in, in terms of, of <coughs> programming some of those spaces and provide, because they, they are very resource-like, you know, they hold things in, like in the attic of the Firehouse Art Center and stuff. Um, but I bet they could handle a better place, and I, I don't think that they're the only ones. Um, but but um, yeah, I think I, I think that we should use for for this summer the space we have and the people we have to try to do something fast. So just, okay, just for, on when you said bus and down to RTD, our contract does not include those extra things for. With RTD, I didn't say anything. I said it doesn't violate our covenant with RTD if we bus our kids using our city bus. If oh, you didn't say yeah, city bus. Well, okay. Yeah, like the, oh, yeah, I don't want to use their stuff. I want to use our stuff. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um, so you know, you mentioned the dancing and the youth council. So at one time we used to have I Drive. Do you remember that? Do you guys know? I know the name. I know. So I know this because unfortunately my children have gotten into trouble in the past that they have been participating in the program. Um, however, it was a very positive, so having those, those positive mentors there. Um, so it kind of brings me back to now that that's gone, you know, we have a group of kids who have kind of just kind of fallen off track. But there's no no support and so one thing that my daughter when she was involved in the program really liked about it was having other kids who were like her not ones that were severely at risk and are dealing with drugs and alcohol in the home but they were just coming from the same families like ours and they just kind of went off track so it was there and they were there with um, counselors with other um, youth mentors so having that, you know, it's, it's like, I feel like we've kind of, we're losing, we've lost that in programs like I Thrive Community Long Run. I think they're still in existence, but they're not in Long Run. So that is, you know, there's there's some that we're lacking. So, so as far as next steps, obviously this is going to come back on the agenda for us. Um, and I assume that agenda is going to look very similar to what it said last week. So I don't know what council members would think, but I would kind of, one way or the other, just start actually getting through these motions and knock down votes and see where the chips fall. I mean, that's, that way we can hopefully avoid, you know, um, charged conversations as much as possible. Uh, I think we've had all the charged conversations that we really need. Like, concerning, you got to do the thing. I'm kidding. It's because you're like family. I only yell at you because I yell at my family, so you're all like family. So, so. I don't know. That, that's just my recommendation, but happy to deal with that. I don't know other council members are not doing it. The only people who I indulge yelling at me are my family members. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not family to you, right? <laughs> no, I'm saying I don't know. I understand that. You know? yeah. Could, could we just clarify one thing? I, I don't want more charged conversations. No. But it would help me here if you would just, and you made reference to not perception. The appearance of The appearance of the right. I'm, I'm clueless as, in terms of what what you think either me, or, and I think you're talking about me, in terms of improper behavior. Yeah. It had nothing to do with anybody acting improperly. Mm -hmm. Why well, I said the appearance of impropriety is because I believe from a certain public out, uh, point of view, that when we have something like Latina, Norma, Latina Voices proposal, and then we have, you know, the Dome proposal and the museum proposal, that it kind of might look like, uh, in my opinion, a council member voting for Dome or or museum uh, would could have the appearance of impropriety because we're council members, we talk to each other. Um, 
do I believe anybody's acting improperly? Absolutely not. There was no accusation made uh, in my statement. Uh, I was just trying, again, to maintain and, and help continue the public trust as much as po possible in our body. Um, and these are these are not my not necessarily all my own thoughts. They're thoughts that I've heard from other people surrounding this whole um, these conversations, as well as how it's been presented. And so that's where the spirit of my comments came from. So, uh, can I just address mm -hmm. okay. to Marsha's point, I agree with you with everything you've said. Um, however, in order to get those programs up to get in all of the things that you mentioned that we could be doing, someone has to do that on staff. And that, uh, that youth programming usually is through the youth services. So, um, I, I don't know if that's what you were alluding to, like the dances or whatever in different parts of the town. Whoever creates those events, Mark and Silver, and that goes to usually the youth services for Well, so. you know, what I, I, I think I was alluding to, yeah. I mean, there, are, there are two things, you know, the public certainly has a perception of impropriety because everybody had their own preference not everybody, and those were the only ones who got a hearing, even though it sounded like in the first meeting that other people <coughs> would get a hearing too. Um, and I thought other people were going to get a hearing, so it's not a surprise to me that, that they reacted that way. But when the city needs to do something fast, well, we don't have our staff do it, we, we subcontract it to somebody. Uh, I don't know why we can't find people who do youth programming and subcontract to them. Um, and and um, you know I think I think that's a way that everybody could be satisfied. So well, I mean, unless anybody has anything else, we're about five minutes till seven. So I just wanted to thank you for for mentioning that. About right. the public. Sure, sure. Um, you know, there's public network calling for recusals from the votes and so Well, and that was what's weird. Like for me, I thought, okay, if I have a proposal, should I even be voting for any of the proposals? So that's something that's kind of within my my brain. It just didn't make sense. But so also then who's left? <laughs> but I also we, think that we did yeah. go to staff as yeah. well. And before we even talked about the yes. proposal, we yeah. wanted to make sure that if this is feasible and reasonable and if we could actually do this and if, you know we know the money was on the table we wanted to make sure that yeah. um, we were intentional and in letting the public know that we wanted something better for our youth yes that was it that's all we were doing we weren't you know but there's nothing impro improper about that yeah uh yeah i can imagine that, that, that you two were involved with and i and, and i I don't know. I don't think I was involved in any improper activity in terms of bringing an idea forward. So, and when we use the word impropriety, it, 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 that's that sounds like somebody has done something of, wrong. Of, 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 well, of course, we're talking about the public here, so they always have a perception uh, I, of impropriety. Well, but but the, but the words being used here among us. Well. What, what I believe is at the root of the perception of impropriety is the idea that uh, it went from looking inclusive to looking exclusive. Well, I just want to say to you two, I have no question about your motivation for your approach. Uh, and uh, I don't know what the cost of a dome would be, but you know, I, I just don't know. But I understand the motivation, and I don't question your heart. In, in what the purpose of your proposal was in the minutes. Well, I apologize if it felt like an accusation to anybody. It was not meant to be that way. It was, it was a repetition of the public loop, and I, I got the same kind of feedback from probably different people. So going forward, when this comes to uh, council again, on the agenda. Let's just go for up and down votes. And do you think? <laughs> well, go ahead. I was going to start at the right time to say that. You asked me if I was willing to withdraw my proposal, and 
I said, no, I don't want to withdraw it, <laughs> but I do intend to, right, to bifurcate it if I can. Okay. I'll take the up or down boat on both parts of that. Okay. Uh, you know, I, yeah. That's what I've been at. But I am going to bifurcate it if I'm allowed to do that, to say, can I make two motions, take one up and down, and the second up and down. So. Yeah, you can. Well, actually, you can go ahead and resolution. Whatever, whatever is easy. If yeah. it's already the, the agenda, then you're ready to go. Well, the, the easy oh, thing God. is <clears throat> the, the direction that we have is to put it back as okay. is. So and, and just that's a heads up. Yeah. For Robert Tools of Order, you can do that. So um, we're not really taking input from the public. This is just. Forgive me, within the study session, will these ever have a public invited paper portion? Not the study session. This is just for us to discuss okay. in an informal thing. So um, thank you for allowing this to happen. I think it's really important that we just talk to each other. Um, next month, I would like it to be uh, on ethics, the first, the first couple of issues on what we would we don't have a lot of time, but if we can at least get our thoughts out and talk, um, I think it's very, very helpful. And we haven't set a date, a time oh, yet. Okay. I need to talk to Harold about that. On what, what, so we, March. What's our, mo our, mo month, our March schedule? It is a little different, right? Because of it is a little different, I'm not clear. Uh, because of NLC. Um, so we're going the 7th, the 14th, and the 21st, correct, John? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So we do have those three. You have yeah. those three. Which one is the study right. session? The 14th is a study session followed by VOC. Okay. So yes. Yeah. Not such a study. Maybe the 21st. VOC? Fourth session. Yeah. LHA. Yeah. Oh. And then, um, so let's do it on the 21st if possible for the pre-session. And, um, and then after, after that one, I would like to know um, if you think these are helpful. Let's don't keep doing this if it's not helpful. So, and that's up to you, Councilor, if you decide that. And until the next meeting. <laughs> so that's yeah. sounds a lot Did you think this was helpful tonight? Yeah. Okay, great. I, I think, think it was helpful mm -hmm. for us to talk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we all kind of know what each other are thinking. Mm -hmm. So when we have that exactly. on the agenda, yeah. we already have discussed it amongst one another. And I appreciate you saying, mm -hmm. you know, next meeting, what's going to happen. So, mm -hmm. our, yeah, I think it's important. Okay. And I think we got the link that um, Eugene sent out on the ethics and mm -hmm. Susie sent out on uh, CML. Yes, the handbook. Yeah. You <coughs> added it on there. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so that's all for us.